on today's episode of Mile Higher. Something more sinister is going on. I mean, it, it gets really, really dark when you dive deeper into this, this religion. One of our favorite topics, especially if you have followed all of the madness that is Scientology. Where is Shelly Miscavige? From a financial point of view, if you invest that much money into this, it would be very hard to feel like you could get out of it. They believe you can be resolved of these engrams that cause you to act this way, but he seems to just be out of control all the time. So a lot of fear-based control here. I mean, especially now with David Miscavige at the helm. So many people believe that she was murdered or is being held captive and like tortured. Why wouldn't they prove that that is not the case for their image as well? It makes a lot of sense to me that he would want to kind of remove her from the public picture. I mean, yeah. it's very clear that David wants to remain in power. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 283. Now, today, we are getting into one of our favorite topics, I would say, something that we have talked about many times on our show. We're going to be talking about Scientology, but we are going into something completely different today, something that I've always wanted to explore, to know more about. It's just driven me crazy. And that is, where is Shelly Miscavige? And I'm sure a lot of you already know that name, are kind of familiar, especially if you have followed all of the madness that is Scientology, the cult that is disguised as a religion, in my opinion. Allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. Yes. I use that word a lot. You do. I'm you a do. tad bit They're a very afraid of them. litigious organization, so uh-huh. we have to tread carefully. Yeah. But I think we're all wondering, you know, as as we know, Scientology started by L. Ron Hubbard. And, you know, we'll be giving you a bit of a, a background on Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard. I, I find L. Ron Hubbard to be, <laughs> he he's a very controversial figure in history. Uh, but yeah. he, man, the guy has some wild ideas and his whole backstory alone is just, I mean, you you couldn't write a movie better than his backstory. Yeah. Truly. Uh, and his, his the paths that he crosses with individ, different individuals throughout history, like on Lights Out, we did an episode on Jack Parsons, this occult rocket scientist guy who kind of like started the whole rocket science, science program at NASA. And he was really into magic and the occult. And he crossed paths with L. Ron Hubbard at one point. Oh, I remember you telling me yeah, about this. Yeah, like this was before, this was back when L. Ron Hubbard was just writing Pulp Fiction and stories, essentially, and he got involved. He was very interested in this concept of magic and the occult, and Mm. there's some very strange stories of L. Ron (laughs) Hubbard being a part of these magic rituals where he'd be, like, sitting in the corner scrying um, or scribing what was happening, and... Scrying? Yeah, scrying is a a magic term. Oh, I've never Um, heard of that. Yeah, yeah. Scrying. And so he would be a scribe. So he'd be observing these rituals and it would be like sex magic rituals. So they would be doing things. Jack would be doing things and Elrond would be sitting in the corner just like writing down like what's happening and Mm. just lots of bizarre things. I mean, Elrond Hubbard for me is a very intriguing individual and how he created this global group. Wild imagination on this guy. It's worth millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, it's, and it's truly insane. Has, I mean, so much power and reach is kind of crazy. It is. It's crazy. It's fascinating, but it's also, it's very sad. It has ruined the oh, lives yeah. of countless people, and people are still suffering, stuck in it today. Um, luckily, there are so many people that speak out, and I think more and more people know the truth now, and it's becoming more mainstream even when we first started talking about Scientology I don't know what year we did our first episode on it but it wasn't as well known by the public I think most people like nine out of ten people you would ask in public would at least have heard of it yeah well especially with uh, Lee Rimney and Mike Rinder when they came yeah. out and there was that whole show I think on A&E oh yes um, that was interesting where they really just like 
opened the the veil or pulled mm-hmm. back the veil on Scientology and really exposed a lot of the abusive practices. And I mean, it, it gets really, really dark yep. uh, when you dive deeper into this this religion as it's classified by the IRS, which is still wild. Yeah. But we really are going to be looking at it as a whole, but honing in on Shelley Miscavige, David Miscavige's wife, which mm-hmm. David took over the Church of Scientology when L. Ron Hubbard left and ultimately uh, died. And so there really hasn't been a whole lot of, of her out there, you know, as far as being visible or in the public. There's been, I mean, there's been nothing. There's been nothing for, for years now, but there's been, yeah, years have passed since we've actually seen her. Or no, We have no idea where she is, and, and those that have left the church are concerned that something may have yeah. happened to her. I mean, there's mm-hmm. a lot of theories about what happened to Shelly, and is she is she okay? Is and that's really alive? become the term that so many Scientologists, ex-Scientologists use, you know, where is Shelly? And uh, Leah has been huge in that. She had a really very fascinating book. Well, if she you was ever wanted friends, to check it with, out. friends with her. Yeah, yeah, she was. And she has really not dropped, you know, questioning and and searching for answers and she's really really amazing so yeah we wanted we you know we've mentioned it before but we've never really dove deep into where is Shelly and kind of understanding the process of how Scientology got started with L. Ron Hubbard and then how did that transfer of power happen with L. Ron Hubbard really it, as you'll find out it was a complete takeover of the church by David Miscavige he's a uh, I mean, I think L. Ron Hubbard's wild. This guy is, or unhinged rather, David Miscavige is, is right there, right there with him. And, and that takeover of power and then the, you know, Shelly Miscavige and her mm-hmm. visibility and then she's just gone. Yeah. And of course, the, the church themselves, they try to claim that she's just living a private life, that she's devoted to the church. Maybe Which may or may case. not be true. We don't yeah, know. We don't know. But most people believe that something more sinister is going on. Because, I mean, yeah, she hasn't been seen since her father's funeral in 2007. Pretty yeah. insane. Yeah, it's pretty wild. But yeah, we definitely need to start with a overview of Scientology for those who aren't familiar or for those who haven't, you know, had a refresh in a while. I think it's helpful just to, to be reminded because... God, it's wild. And there's a lot. It is just so, it goes so, so deep. I don't know if you've seen, there's this guy on TikTok. Oh, I've showed him to you. Yeah, yeah. Do you know his name? Can you try to look him up? Just like TikToker that exposes Scientology. He like goes out front of the church in Los Angeles and like tries to convince people not to go in and like, uh, he goes to I a mean, lot you of could argue he's like harassing the, the members. But I mean, it's a cult and it's dangerous. He's really trying to, a public service and prevent people from ending up in this because they have a we'll talk about it more but they have a way of really luring people in as does every cult right it's what they're doing is not unique to scientology it's it's literally the formula mm-hmm. for every cult that's ever existed yes it usually starts with we have some proprietary way to help you mm-hmm. in one way or another whether it's spiritually mentally not just help you help the world save right. the world yeah or it's there's there's some sort of mission statement mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. that you subscribe to that's greater than yourself and but it requires you giving up everything mm-hmm. to the organization in order to yeah. see those those benefits or rewards and so. of course when they first draw you in like you just walk into the building they it's, yeah it's beautiful there's yeah. lots of cool mm-hmm. things to look at i mm-hmm. mean there's they they claim to be able to get rid of all of these mental illnesses and ailments and help you with various yeah. issues in your life they I mean, sell it to you as like sort of self-help and a, and a it's very much a community and stuff, but then they <laughs> once they get you in you i mean they hook you it's it's truly insane and um terrible what people go through within the church i think it, i mentioned recently my uncle um almost ended up in scientology he was there he did like a week or two of it before he was like this is some whack shit and got out of it but i mean it was and it was a long time ago too um my uncle uh well he's not he's like my oh, second cousin's yeah. husband okay my dad's second cousin. Right. anyway we spent time with him this summer and he was sort of telling us about it but he was like it was just so interesting at first but then they started the auditing with him and he's like okay this is whack i'm out of here but yeah lots to go over so let's go ahead and dive in also because we are supposed to do this now i am kendall 
Hi, I'm Josh. In case you forgot. <laughs> this is Janelle, our lovely producer. Hey. How's it and going? And we are mile higher. We are. Okay. Let's jump in now. So like we said, today we're going to be talking about Shelly's disappearance. But to understand Shelly, you really need to understand Scientology. And that starts with the story of L. Ron Hubbard, the church's founder. So Lafayette Ronald Hubbard, a.k.a. the infamous L. Ron Hubbard, was born on March 13th. 1911 in Tilden, Nebraska. He was raised in Montana and started his career as a writer who wrote science fiction books, baby. Just a great way. Very I mean, creative it's like, individual. Yes, it all makes sense when you hear that element of things. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, he grew up in a military family, so he moved around a lot. So he re- didn't really have a ton of friends growing up. Mm-hmm. So he really kind of filled his time with with the science fiction and, you know, he spent a lot of time reading and things like that. So yeah. it kind of makes sense, you know, why he kind of ended up the way that he did because mm-hmm. uh, he had so much time to just read and consume and then ultimately write. And then he had a stint in the U S Navy, which makes sense. We'll explain this. Yeah. His father as well. was in the Navy. So mm-hmm. he ended up, you know, it's kind of the life that he grew up in. So he followed in his father's footsteps and, yeah. He was also in the Marine Reserves for a little while as well. And then he went into the U.S. Navy uh, for some time. So after the stint in the U.S. Navy, he wrote his famous book, Dianetics, which was published in 1950. And the book is really the keystone of the Scientology belief system. It's basically Hubbard's theory of the relationship between the body and the mind. And according to him, Reading it can cure you of all sorts of mental and physical illnesses. Bold claim. Yeah. So according to the Scientology website, in 1951, L. Ron Hubbard made a breakthrough discovery. He noticed a certain pattern in people who had read Dianetics. And that pattern led him to the conclusion that humans were not their mind or their body. They were spiritual beings. The individual being is the source of all that is good in the world. And with that discovery, Ron invented the religion of Scientology and he founded the Church of Scientology in 1954. It might sound like Ron discovered quite simply that human beings have souls, which, okay, seems, you know, pretty basic. But this discovery was different somehow. So he needed to differentiate his discovery from the idea of a soul by calling it a thetan. And this can be a little confusing, but a person doesn't have a thetan. I mean, oftentimes you'll hear people say, you know, you have a soul, um, but you don't have a thetan. You are a thetan. Sort of the idea that a person doesn't have a soul, but they are a soul. He says that humans are immortal beings who have lived many past lives and will have many more in the future. And this is because the thetan can move outside of the external body with the same awareness that it has in the body but to fulfill your spiritual potential you need to achieve a state of clear this is a big concept in Scientology and this is where you are no longer encumbered by your reactive mind and you only use your analytical mind the reactive mind stores all of your past negative and traumatic experiences it reminds you of those experiences randomly and causes you to have a rational negative and impulsive behaviors like angry outbursts or panic attacks. And these negative experiences are called engrams, and they include things like memories of war, childhood trauma, abuse, sickness, accidents, things like that. And engrams even include traumatic experiences that are said to occur inside the womb, like maternal stress or a pregnant woman hitting her stomach against something. Scientology basically holds itself as the true cure for all things like PTSD, anxiety, ADHD, depression, anger issues, really any and all mental illnesses, including schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Because according to them, their counseling essentially makes you forget all of these experiences. It sort of wipes your slate clean. It's a revolutionary technology that completely eliminates the need for psychiatry or traditional counseling, which, by the way, and this is just wild to me, but Scientology considers psychiatry the root of all evil, which we will get into a little more later. If everyone in the world achieved this state of clear and was free from their reactive mind, there would be no war. There would be no poverty. There would be no greed. No interpersonal conflict, none of that. It would be peace on earth. 
Sounds pretty great, huh? So that's why Scientologists feel as though they are on a mission to save the world. The goal is to get the whole world clear. It's a mission of supreme importance. But as we'll see, it's not just the mission that keeps people so dedicated to the religion. So you might be thinking, this must be pretty crazy technology that Scientologists have in order to be able to cure all people of their mental illnesses. If this stuff is the key to peace on Earth, it's got to be some very high-tech shit, right? Very high-tech shit. So how does one get to this state of clear? Well, the answer is this. Scientology courses, seminars, books, and lots of counseling sessions known as auditing. You have to read a lot and take a lot of classes with your local Scientology church. And of course, all those books and classes cost you moolah. Of course they do. And a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But auditing is at the heart of Scientology's practice. And it's also a huge moneymaker for the church. Auditing is sort of a confusing practice to explain. So as you'll see, a lot of things in Scientology are clear as mud. You know, no pun intended there, but we'll take you through it step by step. So the person receiving an auditing session is known as pre-clear. The pre-clear is given a session by a trained Scientologist known as an auditor. The pre-clear and the auditor sit across from each other. You might have even seen this done before. The pre-clear is given two can-shaped metal objects to hold connected to a device called an e-meter. If you're already familiar with this stuff, this is what people call holding the cans. And as you hold these cans, the auditor asks you a series of questions. You give your answer and the auditor acknowledges the answer. These questions are usually related to past traumatic experiences or instances where you've displayed negative behaviors. They ask about your intentions, your feelings, your thoughts and desires. It's really sort of this weird blend of like faux counseling, interrogation and a lie detector test. And as you give your responses, the thought is that your emotional state is picked up by the cans that you're holding. Somehow like your brain waves are, you know, what you're thinking and mm -hmm. your whole mental state's being transferred into these, these cans. So in response, the auditor can see a needle on the e-meter move to measure your emotional response to the questions. And if you do enough of these sessions, ideally you move up a level to what Scientology calls this bridge to total freedom or the bridge to total financial ruin, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. One source estimates that with all the classes and books and auditing and extras, it costs about 128000 to reach clear. And you could spend all that reach clear and be like, all right, I made it. Like, no, 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 no. There's more levels, of course, beyond the state of clear. These are the operating Thetan or OT levels. From clear, it's another 33,000 to reach OT3 and another 100,000 to 130,000 to reach the current highest level of OT8. A Scientology magazine once stated in 1958 that, quote, according to evidence, both Jesus Christ and Buddha were not at any OT levels. They were only maybe a shade above clear. Ah, uh, makes or, sense. Of course they weren't, weren't OT8 there. No. Nope. So if you know anything about the OT levels and Scientology, you may have heard of this little guy named Xenu. Xenu. Which Scientologists like deny all this, which is funny, but this is, this is actually a thing. Yeah, it's and they don't learn about it because most Scientologists don't learn about it until you reach the OT level of three. But Xenu is basically an evil intergalactic alien overlord who is responsible for all of our ills today. Basically what Xenu did in the past was take billions of his people to Earth where he put them in volcanoes and bombed them. Their bodies died, but these aliens had spirits called Thetans, and they survived the explosion and attached themselves to human beings today. They are known as body Thetans, or BTs, when they implant in people. OTs are taught that these BTs will cause them physical and mental ills. But through more auditing, of course, OTs can cast out these body thetans using their minds. And without these BTs hindering you, you can literally move objects with your mind and cure any physical ailment you have, even cancer. I mean, it sounds, it sounds pretty good, right? Scientologists will deny that they believe in Xenu because they believe that if you knew about them and you weren't properly prepared like a true OT, it would kill you. As mm -hmm. in, you'd hear about Xenu and get cancer and pneumonia and die. Yeah. Pretty okay. wild. Or you would think it's whack and have no interest in moving forward. So there's definitely some uh, science fiction inspirations there with the story of Xenu. <laughs> yeah, totally. And the whole Scientology origin story mm -hmm. or creation story. Now you're probably thinking that all of this sounds like a crock of shit. And you're probably wondering who 
possibly would believe this kind of stuff. But what you really have to understand is obviously they don't start with all this Xenu crap. Scientology lures you in with self-help techniques that are sold as ways to help you solve interpersonal problems and things like that. But as you go up the levels and you spend more and more money, you become more and more indoctrinated. So by the time you reach OT3, it's almost too late in a sense. Well, think about it. I mean, just from a financial point of view, if you invest that much money into this, Mm -hmm. it would be very hard to feel like you could get out of it. You know what I mean? It'd be Mm -hmm. like if you went to medical school and you spent all this money to become a doctor, then you decide not to become a doctor. I mean, right. that's a tough decision to make. Yeah, like once you're in, you're right. You're and obviously, in. that's a that's a just an example and not really mm-hmm. applicable to this circumstance or situation. But yeah, it when you're dealing with your mental health and self help and things like that, transformational things within yourself, that's much much more powerful uh, tool and mechanism. Mm-hmm. Which is why cults like to use that because it's the most personal thing yeah. to us. And they're also known they have a lot of crosses around in their buildings. And so people who come from other countries um, or people who have like some type of religious background and are interested in getting more involved in religion will see that and come in and think that it's related to that. And then like a church. Yeah. yeah. Like a a regular church place of worship. Yeah, They just don't realize they don't. Yeah. They really hide what it is in the beginning and, and lure you in. And they do spend a ton of money on marketing. Oh, yeah. I, we were just watching, uh, I think it was like Discovery Plus or it was like one of the streaming platforms and a Scientology.tv yes. ad came up. Yep. And it's like for their upcoming. I've seen that on YouTube too. Yeah, they run ads. and Actually, I wouldn't be surprised if we end up with some uh, <laughs> Scientology ads on this episode. That's happened before. Yeah, yeah. We've talked about it. They <laughs> The algorithm like picks it up and they advertise on scientology related content pretty interesting and it's kind of like you know in vegas how they'll stand outside and you know try to give you little cards to get you to go to bars or strip clubs or whatever that's kind of their approach they will literally stand outside of their buildings and just walk back and forth on the street and they're like near the mall and near shopping areas and they'll just go up to random people and like come on in and check this out or you get a free i don't know assessment or something or you can check you know and it draws people in. Yeah, they kind of have these like fancy showrooms. I know we've, mm-hmm. there's there's one on Blake Street here in Denver, and I know we've walked past it before. And it, it looks yeah. it looks inviting. Like you're just like curious to know what's going on in there because they have all these it, they have like all these texts and books and things like lots of things to look at and TVs on. Like yep. they they really have created this like showroom for you to come and was visit that and look recently because we were just in Denver. Yeah. And did we? Almost- I, I don't know the. I don't think we were on Blake Street that night. I don't think it was that night that we. There walked was past somewhere it, but- where we were recently. Maybe it was when we were in L.A. last that we almost just decided yeah. to go in to like take a look, but we got kind of scared. I didn't want to have to deal with. Well, them. it's like they also want your information, right? Mm-hmm. They want your contact information. Oh, for sure. They'll probably. I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I assume they would badger you about. Oh yeah. Getting involved. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of practices in Scientology that many people including me, all of us here, believe lead to brainwashing. Scientology essentially operates as a highly profitable, highly litigious, and highly, highly controlling cult. People who critique Scientology are labeled by the church as suppressive persons or SPs. And this is essentially the same thing as being excommunicated. You know, from the Is that just for the Catholic Church, excommunicated? Or is that kind of like a broad uh, thing across yeah, churches? Yeah, I mean, like the... Uh, Mormon church. Oh, they do that too. They do. Ex- it's it's pretty common among a lot of different mm-hmm. religions that mm-hmm. they use a term Band. similar to that. Can you get unex? Can you get recommunicated? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of them give you an option. Like if you're going to follow the rules, it's like a lot of the churches are like, if you're not going to follow what we preach and the doctrine that we believe in, then because y- if you think about it, it's like if you have somebody who's there, who's doing their own thing and not following so to speak, the rules of the church, it can be an issue for the church and for those in power at the church to have somebody mm-hmm. swaying other people's minds. And yeah. most churches Poisoning operate. Poisoning the pool. Right. A lot of churches, op- I mean, almost all churches operate like that, where if somebody is causing a disturbance and problems or, or starting to pull members from the church, they're going to get rid of you. I mean, what's really sad about this too is if you're labeled or someone you know is labeled an SP, 
Scientologists are ordered not to talk to you in any way, no matter who that person is to you. So if you're in the church and your parent or sibling or even child is labeled an SP, you are no longer allowed to have any form of contact with them. And there are punishments for breaking that rule. So many people who leave Scientology end up losing their marriages, their relationships with their kids. I mean, it has broken up so many families and friends. It's, it's truly, truly sad. Children even lose contact with their parents. And if you have generations of family in Scientology and you were raised in the church and you decide to leave, that's it. In an instant, you are cut off from your entire family and most, if not all, of your friends. So that's another reason why people are hesitant to leave. It's like you'll lose everything. Yeah. And that applies with a lot of different religions too, you know. Yeah. It, it, There's that definitely fear others that of being haven't. ostracized. Yeah, or just I mean, who wants to lose contact with their loved ones or their especially their children or their right. parents? I mean, that's And everything you know and everything that's comfortable to you. I mean, you're essentially removed from the only life you've ever known. A lot of people grow up in it, so yeah, yeah. it's the only life that they they've ever known. So right. it's, that's a very scary decision yeah. to make and Leah Remney has talked a lot about how hard that was. Big reason why people stay. Mhm. Mm Suppressive people are what Scientology considers fair game. That means they have the license to stalk, harass, and try to intimidate you as they see fit. And this often includes following SPs around, staking out their homes, filming them wherever they go, buying websites in their name and defaming their character, trying to dig up dirt on you, basically attempting to ruin your life. And of course, it's even harder to leave if you are a member of the Sea Org. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Sea Org, but the Sea Org is the upper echelon of the church, essentially Scientology's paramilitary Navy organization. That's right. They've got their own little Navy organization. Its members are Scientologists who dedicate their entire lives to the church. But it goes beyond that. Not only do they dedicate their life to the church, but their next life and the life after that and all of their future lives. Because when a member joins the Sea Org, they sign the infamous billion-year contract that binds them to the church essentially for the rest of time. Insane. Sea Org members wear the famous uniforms and submit themselves to service the church, and that involves manual labor on one of the Scientology ships, auditing others, and things like that. And there are no families in the Sea Org. You don't really see your spouse. You don't raise your children. None of that. In fact, founding families is basically discouraged in the Sea Org because you are expected to put the group before anything else in your life. Scientology considers abortion to be very morally wrong. But in the Sea Org, women who become pregnant are still pressured to get abortions. Interesting how that works. Also, children in Scientology are not really considered children. They are considered smaller adults, essentially. So they are held to the same standards as adults and are expected to behave just like adults. Standards for the Sea Org members are incredibly, incredibly strict. And if you don't meet them, you risk being sent to RPF, the Rehabilitation Project Force. And this is basically where the Sea Org members who have committed misdeeds are producing low-quality work or are deemed to have evil intentions against the church and its members are sent. And the RPF is essentially a brainwashing labor camp. It's it's pretty scary stuff. So a lot of fear-based control here. I mean, the Scientology, especially now with David Miscavige at the helm, is, is even more so everybody's fearful for speaking out, for doing anything against the church because the, the punishments are are very serious. You're at risk of going to the RPF if you mess up, intentionally or not, and someone writes a knowledge report on you, Scientology is very much a snitching culture. So Scientologists are encouraged or more accurately required to report the wrongdoings or even suspected wrongdoings of other people to the church. If someone writes a knowledge report on you, you'll be called into the Scientology's ethics board and interrogated. These special interrogation sessions are known as security checks or sec checks for short. The goal is to get the person to confess secrets or crimes against Scientology and any negative thoughts they have about the organization or L. Ron Hubbard. These sec checks are performed on every Scientologist as they move up the bridge. Scientologists who reach the OT levels are required to undergo them every six months. So again, this is just a way to control you, a way to keep you in it and keep you accountable to what, what they want you to do. 
And if you're considered a security risk, you could be doing sec checks for six, eight, even 12 hours a day for weeks or even months on end. And what's crazy is you actually have to pay for these sec checks, of course, out of your own pocket. And here are some of the questions asked during the only valid security check. Quote, do you have a secret you are afraid I'll find out? Have you ever been a drug addict? Have you ever peddled dope? Have you ever raped anyone or been raped? Have you ever practiced cannibalism? Have you ever bombed anything? Have you ever murdered anyone? Have you ever tried to act normal? Like what? Yeah, what does that mean? Are my questions embarrassing? Have you you ever used hypnotism to procure sex or money? (laughs) What the fuck? Do you collect sexual objects? Do you have any bastards? Do you feel communism has any good points? Have you ever been a spy for an organization? Have you ever done any illicit diamond buying? The cannibalism question really stands out to me. Like, that is just so strange. Very bizarre. I mean, they're all strange. Yeah, well, it's clear that a lot of these questions are focused on supposed crimes or like deviant behaviors yeah. committed by the person. Mm-hmm. They show what Hubbard considers to be crimes, essentially. So the sec check includes questions like, quote, have you ever practiced homosexuality? Have you ever practiced or assisted intercourse between women? Have you ever slept with a member of a race of another color? What? Well, L. Ron Hubbard, to no surprise, was very much a homophobe. He was against any sexual practice that happened outside of marriage as well. Basically, sex was between a man and a woman only for procreation and anything else was a sin, which is uh, very bizarre. Hubbard once wrote that gay people, quote, should be taken from society as rapidly as possible for here is the level of contagion of immortality and the destruction of ethics. No social order will survive which does not remove these people from its midst. Even children... This is where the fact that children go through this is mind blowing. They undergo sex checks. And here's some of the questions from a sex check for children aged six to 12. Quote, what has somebody told you not to tell? Have you ever made yourself sick, ill, or hurt yourself to make somebody sorry? Do you have a secret? Have you ever noticed something wrong with your body that you're afraid to tell anybody about? Have you ever done anything you were very much ashamed of? Is there anything about you your parents could not understand even if you told them? Have you ever done something you shouldn't have when you were supposed to be in bed or asleep? Have you ever been a coward? Have you ever cried when you shouldn't have? Have you ever made too much fuss over a little hurt? God. I'm just imagining like a six-year-old being asked this and I'm like, how traumatic. Oh, it's so traumatic. What's even worse is that auditing and sec checks are taped. So they become a powerful blackmail tool in the organization. It makes it that much harder for members to leave when they know the organization is holding on to interrogation tapes full of their secrets, which is clearly why they do this. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have blackmail on all of their members, essentially. Yeah. They know all of their members' secrets. Mm-hmm. It's pretty powerful. Scientology, or the Sea Org, came ashore in 1975 and decided to set up shop in Clearwater, Florida. Now, we've have you been, ever been there. Oh. Yeah, we have. Same. It's yeah. interesting. I mean, we didn't go in or yeah. anything, but we drove around. And, it's a compound, dude. Oh, it's massive. Yeah. And everyone's wearing these matching outfits. And They own like such an most of feeling. the city of Clearwater. Yeah. Like most of the real estate there is owned yeah. by the church. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's pretty wild. I mean, if you want to go see, see it live in action, mm-hmm. just go to Clearwater. <laughs> yeah. Check it out for yourself. They have a nice beach, though. Clearwater say. Beach they is do. beautiful. Clearwater Beach is not bad. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is. So they bought the famous Fort Harrison Hotel, which is a beautiful, sprawling hotel complex in the city's downtown area using a straw corporation. And this is known as FLAG, or Scientology's flagship building. But this was supposed to just be the beginning. Around this time, Hubbard wrote plans about wanting to take over the whole city. And over the years, the base grew And the church members started buying properties all over the Clearwater area. And in 2017, church members started buying up retail property in Clearwater at an unprecedented rate. And in less than three years, the sales doubled the amount of property in Clearwater that the church owned. But Scientology has many more facilities. They have locations all over the world, including one right here in Colorado. Like we said, Denver. It's on Blake Street. And there's also the famous headquarters in L.A. called Big Blue. And of course, I mean, 
celebrities are such a huge part of Scientology. Obviously, they want a big flashy building right in LA. And then there's the secretive gold base, which the gold base is a sprawling 500 acre compound located in remote Riverside County, California. The location is also known as the International Base or Int Base or Golden Era Productions, Scientology's film company. Then there's the celebrity centers located in cities like Hollywood, New York City, Nashville, Las Vegas, everywhere you would expect you know, a celebrity center to be. And these are special Scientology centers that are made just for famous celebrities in the church. And there are many of them because L. Ron Hubbard made a lot of effort to really woo celebrities because if they joined, obviously that's amazing PR for the church and an even better recruiting tool. Plus they had lots of money to fork over to the church. Lots of money. Mm hmm. <laughs> Scientology was and still is incredibly lucrative. Um, roughly $500 million per year is uh, what they're bringing in. $500 Which, million. Don't get me wrong. That's a lot of money. But then I was doing research on other religions. And compared to Christianity and such, it's not that much. In fact, Mormons or the Mormon church is estimated to bring in somewhere between 100 to $200 billion. That's with a B. Per year. Okay, I had no idea. Same. I knew that billion. they brought in a lot, but oh, 100 to 200 billion. And when I was reading, it was like they calculated 100 billion, but then they're saying that a lot of stuff they think is like kind of behind closed doors. And so it could be up to 200. <laughs> oh my God, or more. Who yeah, knows? Or more. Who fucking knows? Insane. And one of the reasons that they bring in so much money is because to raise up the bridge, essentially a chart that shows the pro progression of the different levels of Scientology, you have to pay a lot of money. Um, it's it's really sad how how much people end up spending. I mean, money that they don't have to the church. There's courses, there's books, there's lots and lots of auditing sessions, which you're paying for past a certain point. And of course... These courses get more and more expensive as you go up the bridge. So part of the reason it costs so much money is that if one of your auditing sessions is flubbed, which is if there's a mistake in the auditing session, there's a good chance that you'll have to do these sessions again. So you'll have to repeat the level and pay for it again. But of course, the government is going to have a vested interest in taxing all this cash. And of course, the church does not want any part of that money, but a scheme like this is going to piss off not just Uncle Sam, but many other foreign governments around the world. And in fact, most of the reason that Elrond was playing sailor on the Apollo, traveling the world by sea, was to avoid all of the different government agencies trying to nail his ass for fraud. In the meantime, the church fought a long battle to have themselves recognized as a religion, of course. Finally, by 1993, the IRS did just that. And this was a huge win for Scientology because now they could be classified as a church. And that means they were a tax-exempt organization. Now back to David Miscavige, the head of Scientology today. He made the triumphant announcement to a crowd of cheering Scientologists that they became tax-exempt. There is a video of it, correct? Yeah, I think there is, but I, I think it might be copyrighted. Ah, oh, they yeah. copyright everything. That's the thing. We got to be really careful with this episode because, of course. Yeah. They want to protect Of course they yeah. are. Yeah. Well, yeah. you can look it up yourself. There's there's a video and yeah. Well, it like it legitimized them. Fucking nuts. I mean, it made everybody who believe they're a part of this religious yeah, they're like, organization yeah. that they're legit, you yeah. know, and this is. We should be recognized as such. And, mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So. When he made that announcement, in that crowd of people sat his wife, Shelley Miscavige, the right-hand woman and devoted Scientologist. And at the time, this was probably a happy day for Shelley. She cared about the church deeply. She had known nothing else her entire life. But what she didn't know was that the man on stage, David, who vowed to love and protect her, would betray her. And he would do that with the help of the church that she devoted her life to. But before we get into that, we're going to talk about how Shelley Miscavige got to this point, starting from the very beginning. So Shelley was born Michelle Diane Barnett, and she went by Shelley. 
She was born on January 18th, 1961 in Dallas, Texas, to her parents, Maurice or Barney and Mary Florence Flo Fike Barnett. Her mother Flo was a longtime Scientologist, so Shelley was raised in the church. She was taught since she was a child that L. Ron Hubbard was basically the Messiah. Her older sister Clarice was sent to the Sea Org in 1970 when she was just a young teen. A few years later, Shelley was then sent to the Sea Org at the age of 12. At the time, this involved serving on the Apollo, which was actually L. Ron Hubbard's ship, which the whole ship thing is uh, very, very <laughs> odd. It's like he yeah. failed in the Navy, too. Like, that's the <laughs> thing with L. Ron Hubbard is like he was a fraudster his whole whole life. Mm-hmm. And in the Navy, he even tried, he would kind of work his way up the ranks. And every time he got into like a position of leadership, they actually removed him from multiple <laughs> positions of leadership. Mm-hmm. And there was actually one instance where he doctored his own like recommendation note for a position, I believe, within the Navy. And uh, that was like, this is the greatest man to ever like. Th- this just shows yeah. you what kind of guy he is. He uh, just, totally. I mean, he thought he was big imagination. Yes. Even when it comes to himself. Mm -hmm. Had major faith in himself for sure. And of course, we do have other episodes on him that go more in deep if you if you want to know. Yeah. And definitely check out the Jack Parsons episode on Lights Out because the connection between Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard is is a very uh, fun listen. So basically, L. Ron Hubbard founded the Sea Org in the 60s. It was his like paramilitary organization that he was in charge of. And he traveled around on a ship named Apollo. But life on the Sea Org was very tough. It was grueling manual labor with long days and workers got paid just cents on the hour. So essentially slave labor. Hubbard also liked the whole aesthetic of being a sailor. Yet everyone on the ship referred to him as the Commodore. But he also had this creepy practice of keeping around an elite group of Sea Org members known as the Commodore's Messengers. But the Messengers weren't people who rose up the ranks of the Sea Org. You might think that these are, you know, are the most seasoned, experienced Scientologists who spent years proving themselves you know, in order to be a part of this elite team, but it was very much the opposite. In fact, all of these messengers were young, pretty girls picked by Hubbard himself. These girls nice. were very young, which is, of course, extremely creepy, mm-hmm. with their median ages being somewhere around 12 years old. God, he's such a fucking freak. And their job was to deliver messages from Hubbard to other Sea Org members in the exact way he specified. And I mean, we're talking exact, exact. When they delivered the message, they had to use the same tone and mannerisms Hubbard used when giving it. So bizarre. And of course, he had these girls running around delivering messages in a uniform that was just white hot pants, midriff exposing halter tops, platform shoes, and bobby socks. These girls were not just messengers, though. They were Hubbard's enforcers and essentially his snitches. They were fiercely loyal to him and did whatever he said. So if they caught you doing something you weren't supposed to do, guess what? They're reporting you immediately to L. Ron Hubbard, and then there'd be hell to pay. So these girls wielded a lot of authority, and other Sea Org members feared them. Hubbard wouldn't let anyone mess with them or tell them what to do, and by all accounts, he liked these messengers more than his own children, who he never paid enough attention to. In Bareface Messiah, the unauthorized biography of Hubbard, author Russell Miller wrote, quote, It was not in the least unusual for a 14-year-old messenger to march up to a senior executive on the ship and scream, You fucking asshole! You're going to the RPF. That'll teach you to fuck up. It was unthinkable to answer back. It would have been like answering back to Hubbard himself. It's like how serious it was. Mm -hmm. Once a young messenger asked Hubbard why he chose young girls in particular for the job, and the answer, he got the idea from Hitler. Brilliant. (laughs) That's what the messenger said. Uh, Yeah, his uh, fascination with Hitler and like... Yeah, here's what he's... You know, this messenger said about Mm -hmm. what Hubbard had to say about Hitler. Hubbard said Hitler was a madman, but nevertheless a genius in his own right. And the Nazi youth was one of the smartest ideas he ever had. With young people, you had a blank slate and you could write anything you wanted on it and it would be your writing. That was his idea to take young people and mold them into little Hubbards. He said he had girls because women were more loyal than men. Nothing good comes from a sentence that starts with, yeah. Hitler was a man. I got my inspiration man, but... from the most evil man to ever live. Yeah. Who doesn't love good things in life? And part of my New Year's resolution for 2024 is invest in quality over quantity. Even though I enjoy a little luxury, I don't like to spend the money that luxury sometimes costs. But that is until I discovered Quince. Quince is my go to for luxury essentials at affordable prices. 
Quince offers a range of high quality items with prices within reach, like 100% Mongolian cashmere sweaters from $50, washable silk tops and dresses, organic sweaters, and 14 karat gold jewelry. That's definitely one of my favorite things to get on Quince. Their jewelry is amazing. I have gotten necklaces, earrings. I even got a nose ring. Actually, I've gotten three nose rings from them and I just love them. But the best part is all Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, Quince cuts out the cost of the middleman and passes those savings on to us. And Quince only works with factories that, and what's also really great is Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes, which I just love that. And the best part is, like I said, I'm investing in quality over quantity. So I know the things that I get are going to last. I love stocking up on essentials from Quince that I can pair with multiple different outfits and use again and again, and they hold up in the wash. They're just amazing. So give yourself the luxury you deserve with Quince. Go to quince.com slash milehire for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash milehire to get free shipping and 365 day returns, which is pretty sweet. Again, that's quince.com slash milehire. So back to Shelly. And like we said, at the age of 12, Shelly Barnett joined the Messengers. She proved to be extremely loyal to Hubbard. She basically worshipped him and hung off his every word. And Hubbard was sort of like a surrogate father to her in a lot of ways. She was a loner who really didn't hang out with other girls as much. She was very, very focused on her mission, serving the Commodore better than anyone else did. Shelley was fierce in her devotion to him, and she was very much a by-the-book type of girl who followed the rules to a T and made sure that everyone else did the same. But eventually, Hubbard began recruiting young boys as messengers as well. And one of these messengers was a boy named Mike Rinder, who joined the Sea Org and worked on the Apollo starting in 1973. And you might recognize his name already, but we'll talk a little bit more about him later. So in 1976, 16-year-old David Miscavige quit high school and joined the Sea Org. He started out on the Apollo doing menial labor tasks like washing dishes and cleaning the decks. Only a year later, David was moved to the base in La Quinta, California to work under Hubbard producing Scientology training films. And this is where Shelley and David met and their romance began while they were both still teenagers. They started dating in 1978 and would drive to see each other on weekends while Shelley was working in Hemet and David was working in La Quinta. David was a different person at the time. He was charming and pleasant, but he was very ambitious and had his sights set on Scientology's top spot from a young age. David Miscavige was born on April 30th, 1960 in Bristol Township, Pennsylvania to his parents, Ron Miscavige and Loretta Gadero. David was raised in Scientology and his father got the whole family into it and David was allegedly cured of his severe asthma and allergies after just one 45-minute Dianetics session. Pretty amazing. And from there, David became a Scientology prodigy, and he became the youngest auditor at the age of 12. 12, so insane. David and Shelley are a Scientology power couple, and he's making moves to become the high-ranking Scientologist that he had always dreamed of being. Now, that year, L. Ron Hubbard, whose health was declining, went into hiding. For the next six years, only very high-level Scientology executives knew where he was and had contact with him. Even his wife, Mary Sue, didn't know where he is. Yeah, apparently when L. Ron Hubbard stepped down, which he was kind of forced out of his own thing, because yeah. people were like, this guy's losing his marbles, and you <laughs> yeah. know, it, the, the church wasn't going where... The executives wanted and David Miscavige wanted. And apparently when they announced that L. Ron Hubbard was leaving the church, there's cheers from the yeah. crowd. Like yeah. it was like, yeah, yeah. Like, like, eh, yeah, time to go. What's interesting, though, is even though his wife didn't know where he was, one of the people who did know was none other than 19 year old David Miscavige. So, I mean, clearly he they saw a lot of potential in David from a very early age. He was rising up the ranks of Scientology at lightning speed. And even though he was still just a teenager, many people feared him. 
And that's because Hubbard taught him well. David learned from Hubbard the best strategy for getting what you wanted was to berate and yell at anyone below you. David was power hungry. He was ambitious and kind of unhinged. So he took to the rule by fear method easily. Very fitting for him. Mm -hmm. And in December of 1982, David and Shelley got married. During those next few years, Miscavige and two other Sea Org members, Pat and Annie Broker, worked to completely restructure the organization's leadership. This way, they concealed the fact that millions of dollars from the church regularly flowed into Hubbard's pockets. Many high-level employees were canned as part of the restructuring. Hubbard's only known contacts were the brokers and David, so they were the ones delivering messages to and from him. After all, they were part of the CMO. But there's a lot of speculation that many of these orders didn't actually come from Hubbard himself, that they actually came from David. Like David, again, like I said, just hostile takeover of, of the organization. But there was really no way to verify, and letters from Hubbard to Scientologist David Mayo made it sound like he was losing his mind. He was writing long, frenzied letters about psychiatrists saying that they were the root of all evil since the beginning of time. And this allowed David to move the rest of the Hubbard family out of his way. He started with Mary Sue, Hubbard's wife, who was acting as controller, and he told all of Mary Sue's friends that Hubbard wanted her out. And in an explosive meeting with her, David called her an embarrassment to the church, among other things. And she lost her temper at him. She tried to send Ron letters, but he basically abandoned her. Mary Sue had no choice but to step down at this point. Then David had two of Hubbard's kids removed from Gilman Hot Springs for being quote-unquote security risks. He even made one of them his personal maid. And if there were others in David's way, he simply declared them SPs to move them out. On January 24th, 1986, L. Ron Hubbard died of a stroke. A huge upset considering he's supposed to be immortal. <laughs> Seriously? Uh, yeah. So he... Apparently, his own Dianetics didn't work on his uh, uh, physical uh, ailments there. Big turn of events. But David Miscavige spin this, you know, to his followers so that they didn't worry and said, well, L. Ron Hubbard just decided he needed to continue his work on the higher OT level by discarding his physical body, but one day he'd return. Some people believe that Hubbard had actually died years earlier, and David and other messengers covered it up. They did this to buy themselves time to make sure they'd stay at the top once it was announced that L. Ron Hubbard had died. David saw Hubbard's death as an opportunity to be named his successor, and he initiated, like I've been saying, a hostile takeover at age 26. David declared himself chairman of the board of the Religious Technology Center, or COB, and just a year after Hubbard's death, David had managed to make himself the leader of the church. Shelley was not a subservient wife at least not at this time. She was an active participant and essentially David's equal. She could be harsh, but compared to her husband, Shelley was a kinder, gentler person. She was David's first lady, right-hand woman, and known to Scientologists as chairman of the board's assistant. And from 1987 on, she and David started taking the church to new heights. So like we mentioned before, in 1973, Scientology was recognized as a religion and became tax exempt. And David's goal was to have this achieved by the year 2000. So not only was this a huge win, but it was years ahead of schedule. So, I mean, he's looking pretty good as the leader so far. Hubbard's mission to recruit celebrities into the church was one that David took very seriously. And his Biggest win in that department was landing none other than Tom Cruise, which I think is safe to say he is the most well-known Scientologist. Yep, to this right? day. Yeah, like most people, when they think of Scientology, think of Tom Cruise. But other famous Scientologists include John Travolta, Christy Alley, Elizabeth Moss from The Handmaid's Tale, Michael Pena, Danny Masterson, uh, and his siblings, which, yeah, Danny Masterson. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that name this year. Going to be in prison for a long time. Really nasty dude. Uh, Laura Preprin. Um, prep on. Also, pre what is it? Prep, prep on, I think. Prep on. She's also from uh, That 70s Show. Juliette Lewis, Katie Holmes, and Nicole Kidman. Now, Juliette Lewis uh, is no longer part of the church, and either is Nicole Kidman. And, and Katie Holmes ditched a long time ago and left Tom, and good for her. That whole thing was a mess. It was interesting. There were quite a bit of uh, that '70s show yeah. cast members. The the parents too, right? Kitty and uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're a part of it. Yeah, I think so. Lots of rich uh, celebrities. But anyway, Tom Cruise and David Miscavige became the best of friends. Of course, BFFs forever. Whatever Tom wanted, he got. 
really. There was and still is a whole group of Scientologists whose jobs simply involve keeping Tom happy and his affairs taken care of. And this extended into his dating life, which is so whack. It's just unbelievable. So after his breakup with Penelope Cruz in 2004, Tom was repeatedly calling David, asking him to fix him up with a new lady. But David, being David, was very annoyed by the calls. He didn't want to waste his time playing celebrity matchmaker for Tom. So he told Shelly to pick out a new girlfriend for Tom, and Shelly matched him with a woman named Nazanin Bonilla D. But that relationship ended in January of 2005, and then Tom started dating Katie Holmes. And it's been alleged that Shelly set up Tom with Katie Holmes, but other reports say that Tom found her on his own. So not really sure on that. But during this time, David started to unravel. His mental state was growing more and more unstable, and even Shelly began to worry. And according to many former Scientologists, David had a very bad temper and was prone to angry outbursts. And these outbursts became frequently physically violent, which doesn't really make a lot of sense, you know, when he is part of Scientology and they believe you can be resolved of these engrams that cause you to act this way, but he seems to just be out of control all the time. But anyway, sometimes David allegedly beat Scientologists who merely looked at him the wrong way or has Scientologists interrogated if they don't look happy enough at events. It's allegedly not unusual for David to physically beat even high-level executives who displace him. Now, we could do an entire episode just about the abuse allegations against David. He is truly a fucking horrible human. And in fact, the closer you get to the top, the more likely you are to experience the wrath of David Miscavige. One former Scientologist who worked with the Miscavige's said that the closer you were to David, the harder you fell. He liked to abuse those closest to him. And it was not a matter of if you fell, it was when. And the consequences became increasingly severe. In 2004, David's power-hungry and psychotic behavior allegedly hit a new level after he created The Hole. This is essentially a prison for top-level Scientology execs and David's lieutenants. The Hole is located in the secretive gold base compound. It's a building made out of two double-wide trailers outfitted with metal bars where as many as 100 high-level executives are held and tortured. David would send people to the hole for any number of random transgressions, and life in the hole is basically hell. People sent to the hole are kept there for weeks, months, and even years on end. They are subject to group confessionals and interrogations where they are tortured and beaten into confessing their crimes against David. They are forced to sleep in sleeping bags on the floor each night and eat slop made from mess hall leftovers out of buckets trailers are unsanitary and sometimes become ant infested if the electricity is shut off the ac goes out and the temperature inside can rocket up to 106 degrees fahrenheit some former prisoners of the hole have escaped but it's not easy the trailers are heavily guarded if you do manage to escape the fences around gold base are lined with barbed wire and inward pointing spikes if you can get past it there will be sea org recovery teams dispatched to intercept you off the property and since the area is so remote, it really doesn't take them very long to track you down and bring you back. Executives really only leave the hole for two reasons. The first is showering, and the second is being ordered to appear at Scientology events. Showers are done in an on-base garage accompanied by armed guards. Rare appearances at events help the church save face. It's possible for some executives to use these events to escape, but due to the heavy levels of brainwashing, many executives choose to return to the hole for lack of a better word. They've been conditioned to believe they deserve this punishment they're given. Sort of like this ideological Stockholm Syndrome. Beyond escape, the most these executives can do to get out of the holes to hope that their confessions and compliance are enough to eventually please David so that he'll release them. Obviously, creating this sort of thing was a sure sign that David was really starting to lose his shit. He had always had a short fuse and a bad temper, but around this time, his temper tantrums became more and more frequent. Shelley had taken notice of David's increasingly erratic behavior. In fact, she even talked with another high-level Scientologist about how they could clearly see David was starting to go off the deep end. It was dangerous to speak like this about him, and if you found out that they were questioning his behaviors, there'd be hell to pay. 
And there was no doubt that Shelley knew the consequences of pissing David off. She probably knew better than anyone else how boundless his rage was. Even she wasn't safe. So she tried to appease him and keep him happy. The last public footage of Shelley is from September 2004 when she was at the Ideal Org opening in Madrid with David, Tom Cruise, and a slew of other celebs and high-ranking Scientologists. Here's the video. In the video, she can be seen in a tan tank top and blonde hair in a bun. Yeah. I'm powerful. The person singing. I think they have like a band behind them or something. Yeah. Or maybe it's just live music. I don't know. She's just like following him around. Like even his body language towards her just. Even in that clip, it just screams like total lack of respect. She looks real thrilled to be there. That's yeah. for sure. Whether your resolution is to save money, eat better, or stress less, HelloFresh is here to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a price you'll like delivered right to your door. Each HelloFresh box is packed with farm-fresh ingredients and everything arrives pre-portioned right to your doorstep for less hassle and less wasted food. Kendall and I love HelloFresh. We eat like three or four HelloFresh meals a week, chef it up. And last night we had a ravioli. It was a mushroom ravioli with a kind of an Alfredo cream sauce. Oh my God, it with was some grilled so chicken. good. And Holly loved it too. She did love it. Fresh squeezed lemon and we all gobbled it up. I, I could have had more. It was, it was just so good. And that is how it is pretty much every night we have HelloFresh. I have yet to find a meal that we're like, yeah, this one wasn't good. But everything is easy to make. Like last night, that meal took 15 minutes. It was super, super easy. Yeah, I couldn't believe how quick that one was. I was literally juggling again. my toddler and cooking this and it was no no issue. And it turned out absolutely delicious. We love how fresh all the produce is. Seriously, I think HelloFresh's produce is better than what we get at the grocery store, to be honest. And the recipes are just Ah, chef's kiss delicious and very very easy to make especially with their recipe cards it's like six to eight steps maybe if that and then boom you have a delicious often nutritious meal on the dinner table for your family so if you haven't tried hellfresh now is the time we love it and we know you will too go to hellfresh.com slash milehire free and use code milehire free for free breakfast for life you get one breakfast item per box while subscription is active that's free breakfast for life at hellfresh.com slash milehire free with code Malhar free. It's no one heard that HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. So this is when he told David about the Penelope Cruz breakup. So around this time, Shelley is working to keep David happy by keeping Tom happy by finding him a girlfriend. <laughs> it's just so fucking weird. It really is. Got to keep Tommy happy. I mean, he's the biggest marketing tool they have. Yeah. And I'm sure he's given the church a ton of money too. But how fragile is he that he, he is so needs, unhappy to be al alone? Like he needs someone at all times. Well, it's just this like, he's a king, you know, he's like, it's just this culture that David's created. Does he even still act? Yeah. Tom Curry. Yeah. What was he sure in? Yeah. What was the last He thing? was in a recent movie. Um, I've never really seen a Tom Cruise movie, I don't really? think. I don't think isn't he really known for like Top Gun and yeah Top Gun's Mission place. Impossible. Mission Impossible. Yeah, I've never seen any of those. I never saw Top Gun either. I know people love it. Yeah, there's a bunch of Mission Impossible movies, and Tom Cruise like of course he does his own stunts. That's like his the thing oh, with really? Tom Cruise is mm -hmm. he does his own stunts in his movies. Oh. So like when he, there's like a scene of him jumping off of a cliff or an airplane, that's actually Tom Cruise. Interesting. Mm -hmm. My mom it, met him once. She did. Yeah. Oh, that's so random. That's so random. Well. Yeah, she was like working for Paramount. This was a long time ago. And she was walking to her car and he was like walking beside her and got like next to her. He's like, hello, ladies. Like she was with someone else mm. and like got in his Porsche. And back then it wasn't like known that he's, you know, kind of a creeper now. So they no. were like, oh my God, Tom Cruise. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. And I'm sure he gave them the time to, your mom's gorgeous too. <laughs> yeah. Well, look at this too. Yeah. The news, Warner Brothers signs a big deal. 
Cruise yeah. original and franchise films with Tom Cruise. Yeah. Wow. I think he's probably still one of the top oh, grossing yeah. actors. Absolutely. Yeah. He still has a ton paid. of fans. I don't think a lot of people who are fans are like, no. It's not oh, like he yeah. walks around with like Scientology merch no. on, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, but he's very loud and proud about it at the same time. Yeah, he's doing uh, the eighth installment of Mission Impossible. Eighth? Yeah. Good God. <laughs> I think All it's right. coming next year. It's probably vital to Scientology that he keeps oh, yeah. active. Oh, he yeah. Keeps yeah. Up the base sure. and everything. Yeah. Interesting. So moving into 2005, David continued to become more and more unhinged. Surprise, surprise. Shelley was doing her best to essentially keep the situation under control without getting in his way too much. Around that time, David left Gold Base to do business in L.A. for a few months, and Shelley stayed behind at Gold Base. It was one of the first times they were seen apart because they always traveled together everywhere. David would be gone for a few weeks, and she could use that time to tie up some loose ends for him. That would keep him placated. David had been endlessly stressed about the org board or the chain of command at the upper level of Scientology. He needed positions filled and nobody he'd been appointing recently was meeting his very high standards. Shelley knew the org board needed filled, not just to keep David happy, though it needed filled in general. Things were a mess and it needed to be done. She was the chairman of the board's assistant after all, and she needed to keep the church moving. So she filled the org board positions herself. Then there was the issue of the villas. On the north side of the gold base compound, there were three villas that David had been using as his headquarters. These villas were set to be renovated and given to the CMO. That meant that David had to move his stuff into a different, less nice living quarters on base. And this was a project that David had wanted to get done for a while. And nobody likes moving, so of course David had been putting it off grumbling and complaining about it for a while. So Shelly decided to take care of that too. And she moved his stuff for him. And so David would return home and see that he had less stress on his plate, all thanks to his loving wife. So earlier we mentioned Mike Rinder, who was a Sea Org member and messenger as a teen. Now these teenage messengers grew up and they formed the upper elite ranks of Scientology. So by 2005, Mike was now one of these high-level executives. And during this time, Mike visited David while he was in LA. And when Mike returned to Gold Base, Shelly immediately asked to talk to him. She took him to a secluded back patio on base somewhere where no one else could hear them. And Shelly asked Mike, when you saw him, was David wearing his gold or platinum wedding ring? Well, Mike told Shelly that he hadn't noticed, so he couldn't say for sure, and he didn't know whether or not David had more than one wedding ring. But he immediately noticed when talking to her that Shelly was very nervous about the state of her marriage. Her asking that question was a clear signal that she thought something was wrong, like David was upset with her. She tried to be casual about it, but Mike could read between the lines. She couldn't ask Mike the direct question, was David wearing his wedding ring, because it would be too obvious. So she had to ask him if he was wearing the gold or the platinum ring. So Mike thought the whole thing was a little bizarre. He left the gold base and that was the last time that Mike ever saw Shelly. He wasn't there to see David's return. Later in 2006, Mike was sent to the hole where he spent a year being tortured alongside other Scientology execs. He was eventually released and escaped Scientology, luckily for him, in 2007 while in London. And when David finally got back to the gold base, he saw what Shelly had done and he flipped the fuck out. What she thought were caring gestures were mortal sins in David's eyes. One witness reported that he had a psychotic fit and called everyone treasonous fucks. And then after that, he turned right back around and left for LA. Now, Shelly still tried to salvage things. A few days later, she drove from Gold Base to L.A. to try and save her marriage, but she came back defeated and unsuccessful. And a week after David returned to Gold, Shelly was gone. That day, sometime in late 2005 to early 2006, Shelly's assistant saw her being escorted into a car, and she was in tears and covering her face as if she was trying not to show the assistant that she was crying. Shelly got into the car And that was that. And she was not seen again until early August 2007. Now, her being sent away was likely a combination of things. David may have thought that Shelly was sort of a liability to his role 
or that she would try to start an internal rebellion against David based on his recent behavior. Maybe he got wind that Shelly was talking about his mental state with others. And so he took the moving of his things and org chart fillings as her taking steps to oust him. So he sent her away to prevent this and also to prevent her from testifying to the police or outside world or other Scientologists about things and or to stop her from being subpoenaed. It's also speculated that David sent her away after she told him that she couldn't take his behavior anymore or questioned him directly. Some people have speculated that she was so sick of David that she got herself sent away. But Tony Ortega argues that her last ditch car trip to L.A. says otherwise. For the rest of that year, the world didn't hear a peep from Shelley Miscavige. She vanished, but she wasn't entirely forgotten. It makes a lot of sense to me that he would want to kind of remove her from the public picture. I mean, yeah. it's very clear that David wants to remain in power, and that is the most important thing to him. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're his mom, brother, wife like if you are yeah. a threat to him possibly in any way mm -hmm. or you're trying to you know start this rebellion against him to remove yep. him he's His, gonna remove you first yeah i mean just look at the way that he took over the church yeah. it's exact way and he knows that that could happen to him so he's just not gonna let that happen yeah in november of 2006 katie holmes and tom cruise got married in italy david miscavige was tom's best man the lavish wedding was full of guests, including many celebrities and many high-profile Scientologists. That included actress Leah Remini, who had grown up in Scientology. God, I remember this wedding so well. It was such a big deal. We were in middle school, and it was all over the tabloids. And I was like, I didn't even know about I remember seeing the tabloids yeah. at the grocery store. I remember thinking it was, I was like so enthralled by it. And I thought Katie Holmes was the most beautiful. She, she is just stunning. And thought he, I thought he was pretty hot and just the whole thing. I don't know. It was, it was, it was people were really, really into it. And I feel like most people didn't really understand the Scientology thing back then. So that wasn't, I don't think many people, like the average person even knew he was related to it at that point. You know? Well, think about it. Like, or maybe I was just young. I don't know. We all didn't really know what was going on until Leah Remini. Yeah, that's very true. Came out, you know, and that was years later. So it's like, yeah, like the masses. Back then, it, yeah. we all kind of just looked at it as like, oh, it's this weird club, or like it kind of yeah. just seems like all these elites and yeah. any other type of like fraternal organization, kind of mm -hmm. like the Freemasons or, you yeah. know, something along those like the Elk Lot, you know, one right. of these organizations that's just kind of like fancy pantsy. And totally. I don't think any of us really knew, you know, what was really going on back then. But guess who's notably absent at this grand wedding? None other than David's wife, Shelly. And Leah wasn't sure why she wouldn't be at such an important event. In fact, she hadn't heard from Shelly in a very long time, and that worried her. Because Leah and Shelly had been friends pretty much for most of their lives. So they frequently sent letters back and forth to each other, and Shelly was always good about responding right away. But in the past few months, Shelly had stopped responding completely, and Leah was getting increasingly worried. And now Shelly was a no-show at what Scientology called the wedding of the century. And Leah couldn't understand why. So she asked a simple question. Where's Shelly? She had no idea that that one simple question would spark a chain reaction that would change everything. Leah had said she hadn't heard from Shelly in a while. And when she asked where Shelly was, a high-level Sea Org member snapped back and said, quote, You don't have the fucking rank to ask where Shelly is. She was probably so confused by that response. Yeah. Like, it's just such a casual question. You don't have the rank to know where she is. I mean, is. that says a like, lot right there. Yeah. I can't know where my friend is. Yeah. So, and, and she really didn't understand why people were so angry with her for just asking where she was. So, obviously, this would make anybody feel like something's up. Something's mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. So, while she was in Italy, she sent a message over to her assistant. Leah wanted to write knowledge reports on multiple high-powered Scientologists, including Tom Cruise and even David Miscavige himself. She's always had balls. Yeah, that seemed like a brave move. I love her. She's a, yeah, she's a tough cookie, man. She is. I've loved her since the King of Queens. Yeah, what show was that? <laughs> is that what it was? I think it's, is it Kings and Queens? I think it's King of Queens. I don't know. Bro, you're asking the wrong person. Great King show. King of Queens? Great show. I used to King watch of Queens. All the time. King of, King of Queens? Yeah, yep. King of Queens. The yeah. King of Queens. Yeah. Yeah. Also has my man, Kevin James. Paul oh, yeah. Blart, Mall Cop. 
for life. Okay, I love sorry, how I'm that's the movie him. you always think of. Kevin James. He's just Paul Blart. He's in so many. You always go to Paul Blart. It's I, like oh, and Grown Ups. I love Grown Ups. He's True. in Grown Ups too. He <laughs> he actually has an interesting podcast with uh, Leah. If you if someone ever want talking about Scientology, if you ever want to listen, was to he it. in? Was he a Scientologist? No, no. Oh. And he like he never really understood like what she was doing when they worked together on oh. it because she was still in it when she was on the show. Oh. But yeah, they have an interesting conversation about it. I recommend listening to it if you have time. Anyway, anyways, sorry. it was clear to Leah that something bad was going on. And of course, they're taught as Scientologists to report these kinds of things. So Leah thought she was doing what was best for the church, like she was doing her duty. She didn't realize that she'd be severely punished for these actions when she got back to the States. When she came back, Leah was subjected to months of 12 hour a day sec checking that almost pushed her to a complete mental breakdown. Scientology also subjected her to a quote, truth rundown basically a re-education program and these sessions cost her hundreds of thousands of dollars she she lost so much money in scientology she goes over it a lot and it's just shocking how much money it's fucking nuts so after that leah quieted down she confessed to and apologized for things that she didn't do she even bought scientologists who attended the wedding including tom cruise expensive apology gifts but leah couldn't shake that feeling that something was wrong she couldn't get the question, where is Shelly, out of her head. So for the next six years, she continued to try and get in contact with her. She sent letter after letter to Shelly, but these were never delivered to her. On June 25th, 2007, Shelly's father, Maurice, passed away. Surprisingly, wherever Shelly was being held, she was allowed to leave to attend the funeral. Of course, she was accompanied by her Scientology handler. Now, that fact is definitely kind of throws a wrench into a lot of theories. Not a wrench, but... I mean, because many people believe that sh- something happened to her before the wedding. Um, but then when she was seen again at the funeral, that kind of s- more people lean now towards the idea of her being held somewhere or being in hiding. I don't know. I mean, who knows? Um, Versus like, yeah, she was physically harmed or yeah, something before the wedding, because that was kind of the idea for a while. But I mean. I, I we still, still think, don't know. Yeah. I for sure think it's still a possibility, but that's just me. I don't know. But at the funeral in the bathroom, a former Scientologist approached Shelly and asked for help with something urgent. The woman was just declared a suppressive person and she didn't know what to do, but Shelly responded, quote, listen to me. I fucked up and I'm not going to be able to help you. And this is largely considered the last in-person sighting of Shelly. We know nothing about her whereabouts until 2010 which in that year, Shelly got her driver's license renewed at a DMV office in West Covina, California. The photo taken at this office is the first photo of Shelly the public has seen since 2004, and it's the first public sighting of Shelly since 2007. There has not been another photo of Shelly released since. Now, if you're listening, uh, you can you know look up the picture on your own, but if you're watching, just, just look at this picture, man. Yeah. She looks like she has been through hell. She looks miserable. Looks like a different person almost. Yeah. So Lee Remini left the Church of Scientology in July of 2013. And one month later, August 5th, 2013, she filed a missing persons report for Shelly. The whole thing immediately became a media frenzy, especially because Leah was publicly denouncing the church and its abuses. And like we said earlier, this is when a lot of this started to come to light. Now, getting the police involved in the matter is a huge crime for Scientology. They believe that these are internal matters, like we said, and getting the police involved is just absolutely not allowed. But anyways, days after Leah filed the report, the LAPD set up a meeting with Shelly through her lawyer. They arranged to meet at a coffee shop in West Covina, California on August 8th, 2013. And there they met with a woman who claimed to be Shelly Miscavige and her attorney. The LAPD detectives checked the woman's ID. They took her fingerprints and left. But here's the thing. When two LAPD lab technicians got the prints from the coffee shop, they compared them with Shelly's fingerprints that the DMV had on file. And these lab technicians could not match the sets conclusively. It appears that the fingerprints were actually not taken properly, which is just sucks either the detectives weren't properly trained on how to take them or the person giving the fingerprint 
wasn't properly instructed on how to leave them. But despite this, the LAPD didn't try to collect another set of fingerprints. In fact, despite the prints not matching, they closed the case and removed Shelly from the missing persons database. They declared the missing persons report unfounded. And it gets even weirder. Even though they closed the case for unknown reasons, the LAPD asked the coffee shop to send over their security footage from the date and time of their meeting. The coffee shop sent over the footage from each camera a week later, but when police reviewed the tapes, they found the footage from all of them had been scrambled to the point where you couldn't make out anything on them. Hmm. That's uh, strange. Seems uh, tampered with, maybe. peculiar. Let's be real. Investing can be intimidating. I know it was for me. So intimidating that it might feel easier to just push it off and not think about it. Even if you can identify with that, today's sponsor might just be the thing to kick you into gear. Today's episode is sponsored by Acorns. Acorns helps you automatically save and invest for your future. You don't need a lot of money to get started. You can even start by investing your spare change with Roundups. The app even gives you access to education and guidance to learn more about investing. Head to acorns.com slash milehire to sign up for Acorns to start saving and investing for your future today. I've personally used Acorns in the past and I really like how easy they really make it to understand and how to get started with investing. And I think their roundups feature is a really, really good place to start because it requires no thinking on your part and it's just rounding up on all your purchases and putting that money into your investment account with them, which is awesome. Investing involves risk including the loss of principal. Please consider your objectives, risk tolerance, and Acorns fees before investing. Acorns Advisors, LLC. Acorns is an SEC-registered investment advisor. Brokerage services are provided to clients of Acorns by Acorns Securities, LLC. Member FINRA SIPC. For more information, visit acorns.com. So many people think that Scientology paid off the LAPD to make this statement. I mean, they certainly have the funds to do that. And they never actually visited Shelley. Again, Scientology, like I said, has deep pockets. So they have more than enough money to buy off the cops. And the LAPD, as we know, has a long history of corruption. Oh, yes. They definitely do. Put two and two together. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it's also possible that they did visit Shelley. If she expressed that her wish was to remain hidden from the public, they'd have to respect that. I mean, it's your right to do that. And they can't give up her location or show a photo of her. And all they can say is that she is alive and okay. And yes, she may have been brainwashed into wanting to stay, but that's not necessarily illegal. And the cops can't force her to leave. But everyone is still wondering where she is because nobody has really seen her since 2007. How many years is that? 24 now. Yeah, 17 years. What? Yeah. Yep. 17, right? Yeah, my math's good. (laughs) Is it? Yeah. Okay. You can trust my math. I'll take your word on that. Yeah. God, it's, it's a 17 long, years. Yeah, 17 long years. That's a lot time. of time. So what's she been up to? Yeah. Where's, yeah. Where is Shelly? That's the question. And we do know that she's not in the hole at the gold base because defectors who were held in the hole during the years 2006 to 2016 have come out and said that she was not held there at any point during their captivity there. Many Scientologists believe that Shelly is alive and being held at Scientology's Church of Spiritual Technology headquarters in remote Twin Peaks, California. This has been confirmed by sources who have spoken to Tony Ortega of the Underground Bunker website. Tony is an investigative journalist who has been extensively covering the Church of Scientology. He has a a lot of good information out there if you want to, you know, look more into his work. Yeah, there's some ex-Scientologists that say that this Spiritual Technology Center is in nearby Arrowhead, Little Arrowhead, California. Uh, which this location is in the mountains near like Arrowhead. But yeah, I mean, they have a lot of different secret locations too. They have like underground bunkers and, yeah. you know, they have all of L. Ron Hubbard's uh, memorabilia, I guess, and his works stored away so that if uh, the apocalypse comes, which they believe in, of course they uh, do. <laughs> that, you know, Scientology will live on. Mm-hmm. So she, I mean, who knows? She could be anywhere. Yeah. So the Church of Spiritual Technology, or CST, is a Scientology organization dedicated to preserving L. Ron Hubbard's works for all of eternity. That way, his works can be passed on for hundreds of generations and even to alien civilizations uh, when they finally uh, reveal themselves. So CST essentially takes his written works and etches them on steel plates or even gold laser engraved discs. 
These plates are put into titanium boxes with inert gases and held in multiple high security underground vaults. The goal is to have the work be able to withstand fire, flood, famine, any natural disaster, even nuclear war. We'll still have L. Ron Hubbard's work to view. According to sources who spoke to Tony Ortega, Shelley has allegedly been living and working there since late 2005, early 2006. Outside of her father's funeral, any attempts to have Shelley see her family have been unsuccessful. Sometime around 2013, someone allegedly asked Shelley when the next time she might see her family would be, and she responded, quote, there's only one way. And Mike Rinder thinks this is a reference to the last time Shelley was able to leave CST. So that might mean the only time she's ever getting out again is to attend a family funeral. These sources told Tony Ortega that Shelley has been conditioned to believe that it's her fault she is stuck at CST. That, and she believes she's doing important work preserving Elrond's technology for future generations. But even if she tried to escape, this would be very difficult. The CST headquarters are heavily guarded, covered in cameras, and surrounded by a spiked fence. Scientology claims these spikes are to keep bears out, and yet the spikes face inward towards the property. So if you were inside of it, so you can't get outside of it, why would the bears be inside the property fence? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. As for David, sources told Tony Ortega that after Shelley disappeared, David told executives that they were, quote, done as a couple. But as a religious leader, he couldn't divorce her. Scientology has repeatedly stated that Shelley is not missing. They say that she's simply working on special Scientology project and wants to live her life privately out of the public eye. And of course, they've said that Lee Remney is a lunatic who's been obsessively stalking Shelley because she hates Scientology. And according to the LAPD, Shelley is not missing and her case is closed, but Shelley has not been seen publicly since 2007, 2010 if you count that DMV picture. So as far as we know, she is still missing. But Shelley is really just the tip of the iceberg. There are 130 some high level Scientology execs that are essentially missing or are stuck in the hole in gold base. Of course, Scientology has said that the hole doesn't exist and never existed. Lee Remney and Mike Rinder have both become some of the most well-known and outspoken Scientology defactors. They made it their mission to expose Scientology's abuses, and Lee won't stop asking where Shelly is until she's found. So there you have it. It's really hard to make out like where she is. There's just no, no. way to know. I... <sighs> I, don't know. I hope she's still alive. At the very I least, too. I hope she's still alive, and I, mean, I hope she's not hope that like enduring suffering. Oh, every I'm day. sure. I mean, it's hard. I'm sure she is. Possibly, or she's just brainwashed to the point where that this is just the life that she knows. And I just think with all of the um the conversation around and all the pressure on them that they would have like brought her out. That, that's what's so weird to me. Like, why not just have her make a quick appearance? Just be with David somewhere. Maybe they're worried that that just brings more attention to to this issue. Uh, and and that. also, could it like... validate, does it validate what Leah Remney's doing? You know what I mean? Does it give her more power and it creates headlines? And you know what I mean? It'll kind of stir up the whole media if they do that. I right? guess so. But they're also being accused of, of murdering her so if she's alive and well why not bring yeah but her they out? know there's no evidence they know there's no evidence they're not being investigated for that so like why would like they do that widely believed sure but the police aren't investigating a murder so why would they subject them they're very very careful about what they do clearly yeah and they don't want bad pr you know what i mean so they're they're managing it and it's easiest from their perspective, it to just be like, oh yeah, she's working on a special project. She doesn't want to be seen. I guess so. I don't know. I just I I think I don't know. I don't know. My gut feeling is that she's I don't know. Either something really terrible has happened to her, something physical or mental, or or she's not alive. I mean, seventeen years is a long time. Yeah. So it is a possibility and they have the perfect way to cover it up, right? Like Oh yeah. They're for sure. They are very hard to infiltrate. Well, it's like it's clear that she didn't just I think we can all agree here that she didn't just make the decision to to no longer be seen and like be behind the scene. Come on. Like especially with what she was telling people and the events leading up to it and 
the way that she was being treated, worried about the rings. I don't know. I think, and it's so, fr- the whole fingerprinting thing is so frustrating. I just, I think there's some major fuckery that happened with that. I don't know. I'm curious to hear what you guys think. I mean, I, I certainly think wherever she is or whatever's going on, it's not, it's not good. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I think necessarily. I think, I think there is a real possibility that she truly believes in the mission that she's doing and she's still dedicated to it. Cause as far as there's not a whole lot of evidence that we have to suggest that she was like actively trying, trying to get out. You no, know what I mean? right. So like, but as the, far as we know, right. Like, as far as we know, and we don't know a lot, they but like everything the, under wraps, they have like, the FBI has investigated church Scientology for human trafficking before like people, they do have, they know they have eyes on them. They know that they're, the authorities are, you know, definitely paying attention to what's going on with this organization because yeah, but we also know they could be paying them off. The FBI. Well, maybe not. the yeah, FBI, but, but I, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. I, don't I, know. I just think maybe that I'm too conspiratorial, but they are very, very, they keep, everything close to your chest they're very well protected they have everything isolated and i mean they're probably in my eyes like one of the most dangerous cults for that very reason that they are so powerful they do have so much money and they have so many places that they can hide things you know what i mean i totally see your points that they may not want to have proof that she is alive and well because it would be maybe validating leah or bringing more attention to the situation. But I think there's more, I mean, what do I know? I'm not in the ends of Scientology, but I feel like as an outsider looking in, but there's like, more pros to sure. to just having her make a quick appearance or like releasing a photo of her or a statement. I guess people wouldn't believe a statement. But I don't know. Why not have the, you know, police confirm the fingerprints or I, something. But could she have just realized like, is it possible... Shelly, you know, in those those alleged statements from her that we have, like maybe she really believes that she messed up in the eyes of David, or you know, maybe she, I mean, she's been in it from the very beginning, a child. Like maybe she so believes I just, she deserves to be, yeah. Punished like and I hidden. feel like maybe she just she believes like truly that this is her mission, and you know, to be kept in hiding, and it's embarrassing for David if she does come out, and is you know what I mean, and like she's still. Yeah. Trying to protect the church and protect David. And this is what David's brainwasher and doing. I mean, I don't think any of it, it's not good. None of it's good. There's nothing yeah. happy here at all. It's no. just, this is the, this is what a cult cult does. But I just don't, I'm like, what's the motive for them to murder her? Like to me, well, what that, if she was like going to come out and release things or like possibly, yeah, that's, that's a possibility or, or knew something that she wasn't supposed to know. Like what was it that she was saying to, that like, she fucked up about? What? Sure. It must've been huge. Well, they keep people locked up allegedly. So, you know, that couldn't, they just go keep her locked up somewhere and like nobody would ever know I, yeah, I, as opposed could. to just they straight could. getting rid of her completely. You know what I mean? So like I struggle with like them getting rid of her completely. Cause I feel like that would, that could be harder to keep under wraps for this long as I, opposed to, I don't know. I think with all, there's so much bad publicity for them with the idea. Cause so many people believe that she was murdered or is being held captive and like tortured. Why wouldn't they prove that that is not the case for their image as well? Yeah, and she's such a huge figure. I mean, David Miscavige's wife. It's, it's just, it's too weird to think, I just can't, I can't, I just can't accept that she's just ch- chosen to stay hidden or they've just been able to keep her. But hidden. was like she they're... actually trying to get out? That's, that's my whole point is like, was she ever trying to get out of Scientology? I don't know that. I don't know because that's, Th- there I is think, no evidence. For I think that. that's the question that I have is like, at what, was there any point at which she was ever trying to get out? And maybe we just don't, we'll never know. We'll obviously probably never know that. So what's interesting though so every five years in California, make sure this is good information. Yeah. In California, drivers must renew their driver's license every five years. So where's the 2015? Yes. Where's the 2020? Yep. I was wondering pictures? the same thing. Again, though, like 
how do those get released? You know what I mean? Like, do those get released all the time? I think that was released because they were doing that, you know, investigation or whatever at that time. So maybe they just that's not released. just public information, right? No, you no, can't just no, like no, pull no. up people's yeah, driver's license. Course. God. So that that's my other question is like, can anybody find her her driver's license renewal from 2015, 2020, and then she'd be due for another one next year if it's every five years? Although a lot of times you can renew your license without renewing your picture. That's very true. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. So it's possible they just like renewed it online and sent her a new license. Mm -hmm. But it's like, where is she even driving? That's my thing. Like maybe she doesn't even have a license. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. That's a good point. And certainly she's probably not traveling or anything. No matter what, whether she was taken care of or she's being hidden, she's a major threat to David that she yeah. knows some shit and could like, Oh, unravel sure. oh, yeah. everything. Yeah. So there is motive for David to keep her hidden or locked away or whatever it may be. Yep. And possibly even motive her. to to kill her. Allegedly. Uh, allegedly. Yes, allegedly. 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 Um, I just I in my mind I don't think there's any like a very, very, very small chance that she's chosen to just stay out of public eye. But she might be. If she might that brainwashed. She might. She might have. They could have. They could have convinced her. Yeah. yeah. That you need to do this for the the safety of everybody in Scientology. Like your greater purpose now is to stay out of the the limelight and work on this spiritual technology stuff. You know. I just think, um, God, I was one of my dream interviews would be with Leah Remney. Yeah. If you're listening. So I would be interested to interview anyone who's an ex-Scientologist. Yeah. I mean, it, the world is just so, it's so fascinating and scary. Yeah, it's wild that they were given Dark. religious tax exempt status because that just like God. solidified them. The fact that that. Uh, and ma it makes it extremely difficult to. Yeah. To really investigate them and, and, and they've just like built their, they built their system in a way. That it's like this fortress, mm -hmm. impenetrable. So yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure as time goes on, eventually we'll find out one way or another. I mean, maybe. So maybe I mean, she was 43 when she was last seen. How old is? She, how old would she be now? Let me look it up. That was what 2007. She'd be like in her like 60. 62. 62. God. How old is David? Uh, 63. 63. Mm -hmm. Tony Ortega's 60. Lee Remney's 53. Mike Grinder's 68. <sighs> God, it's so frustrating. Well, if any, if anyone out there is listening or like knows of someone who would be interested in interviewing who's an ex-Scientologist or has more thoughts on all this, I would, that is an interview I would love, love to do. Um, where can they reach out for that? Let's, do we have, what's our email for... Uh, increase mhp at milehire.com mhp at milehire.com yeah i'd always interested to learn more leah remini would be such an interesting guest i think she is such a badass and has done so much so much good for this this community of people who so many people have just suffered beyond belief through scientology it's really incredibly sad you know as fascinating as it is it's just like it's horrific it is very peculiar to me why why it wouldn't be a better image for the church for david to have his wife by his side you know if she's really the the first lady of scientology you know i feel like it raises more questions and creates more doubt in people to not have her publicly visible so on that point i'm like hmm, maybe she doesn't you know maybe she was trying to come forward with some stuff and they put her away so mm -hmm. that didn't happen yeah, I, I don't know. This one's really tough. Well, of course, I, we're curious to hear all of your thoughts. Um, where where do you think Shelly is? Let us know in the comments. And uh, you can head to our Instagram page if you're an audio listener and uh, leave us your thoughts there as well. That is at Mile Higher Pod. Um, I hope to do some more topics related to Scientology. If there's anything specific that 
you're looking for us to discuss and explore more, definitely comment and let us know. I would be interested to do so. Absolutely. But that's going to be it for us today. That is. We will be back next week. With another one. Absolutely. And until then, keep keep on on taking taking your mind a mile higher. (laughs) There we go. We can say it at the same time as me. Cool. We can do it in unison. Beautiful. All right. (laughs) We'll see you guys next time. See ya.